to do a dolly by sort of pulling you up, yeah, and then um, and, and then while you're micing up, I'll get them all the finger questions and. Um, Okay, welcome everyone. Can those at the back here still hear me on this mic? Okay. So thanks a lot, lot for coming. It's a UQ Energy Exchange, uh, Express seminar tonight, uh, which is co-hosted by the Centre for Coal Seam Gas. Uh, but also I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Dow Centre for Sustainable Engineering Innovation, who is the actual host organisation for, for Professor Small, because um, he's, he's working on a particular project with us. So. Uh, Professor Mitchell J. Small is the um, John Hines, the second professor uh, of environmental engineering at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. He holds po uh, positions in civil and, en en civil and environmental engineering and in engineering and public policy. Um, there are two schools at Carnegie Mellon. I'm not going to give a great deal of uh, insight into what he's going to talk about because I've seen the presentation, but. Effectively, one of the challenges we have in particularly contentious developments in Australia and everywhere in the world these days is how public perception is affected by scientific information and so forth, both on the benefits side of an industry and the risks side of an industry. So Mitchell is going to give us a, a look at that from a particularly looking at the uh, experiences of the US shale gas developments. And, uh, and I think it's a very interesting um, presentation which is very relevant to some of the developments going on in Australia. So without further ado, I'll welcome Mitchell to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, did you unmute my microphone? Yes. Okay. So, let's 
see if this is working. Uh, testing, everyone can hear me? Okay, very nice. Uh, yes, so uh, that's me. Uh, uh, and this is you, and I've had a lovely three weeks here, and I hope to come back. Uh, it took me three weeks to learn to put the day first, but I finally did it. Uh, and uh, this talk is going to have really two parts to it. One is a, a light, a theoretical part on the value of information, but it'll be kind of a light theory. And then an applied part on uh, U.S. shale gas uh, developments. Uh, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be a little heavier, actually, a heavy applied part. So let's see if I can make this work here. Okay. So uh, as I indicated, I will talk first. This is really the first half of the talk over there. Probably can't see that or not. Okay. On the uh, uh, different approaches to value of information from a scientific perspective as scientists, uh, what do we mean when we say that information has value or studies or new science, new knowledge has value? Uh, from the perspective of really a, almost a...
So I'm going to invite Mitch now to sit here along with our guests. So we have Andrew Garnett, who's going to facilitate the Q&A. Andrew's the uh, director of the Centre for Coal Seam Gas. Uh, Professor Will Ripken, who's the chair in um, social performance in the centre. And uh, Joanne Everingham, who's a senior research fellow also in the Centre for social, Re social Responsibility in Mining. So while you mic up, and I'm going to look for some spare batteries for Mitch's mic, um, think about your questions, uh, and, but Andrew will be the one taking them. While, um, while Mitch is micing up, uh, I'm going to ask uh, the two on the left to give him a bit of a voice break. Uh, and I'm going to ask Will and, and Joanne just to comment a little bit on, on what we've just heard. And I'm going to start with Will. I'm asking him actually to bring us a little bit up to speed with some of the work that's just finished on, uh, on actually one of the big um, research gaps about the cumulative socioeconomic impacts. And then I'm going to ask Joanne to reflect a little bit on the value of information and particularly in science information from her experience of working in these regions. Uh, so with that, Will, could you just uh, explain where you are with the research so far in the, um, in the cumulative impacts of these gas developments? Okay, can you in the back hear me okay? If you can't hear me, you're not gonna miss much. You can ask somebody in front. We've been conducting research for the past four years on the cumulative social and economic impacts of coal seam gas development in the Darling Downs. It's an area of about 40,000 square kilometers with about 40,000 people expecting up to 40,000 wells. Uh, the trends, the things that we've been tracking are things like population, income, unemployment, housing costs, and crime rates. We've been looking at trends over 15 years so we can get a good chunk of time before the CSG development occurred as well as tracking the trends through the peak in the construction period from 2011 to 2014, and then tracking uh, to identify what's the new normal, what's going to be happening after 2014, 15, 16. Will there be an economic bump in the region? Will things look like they're better off? Or will they be tra tracking the historic trend? So the findings we've come up with are one of the main things that occurred during that big CSG construction boom is a big increase in activity in the area and lots of movement. People moving in, people moving out, people moving within the region, people driving in and flying into work and flying out. And that has effects on social capital, the strength of ties between people in the region. So some of the things when you look at something like movement is it's not only how many people are moving, but who's moving. Who's moving in and who's leaving and how, that, how does that affect the character of the region? because these are predominantly small country towns that have a particular flavor to them. So that's a bit of a teaser of what we've been coming up with. Thanks, Will. And uh, Joanne, you've been working in this area for a, a, fair, a fair few, um, a fair while. Thank, thanks, Al. <laughs> just being, so I'd, could you, <laughs> I'm just being careful how I say that now. Uh, so I wonder if you could just reflect on, on some of the stuff you've heard about the value okay. of scientific information in, in your experience. Okay, thank you. And I think people prob can probably hear me as well. Um, so, yes, well, uh, thanks very much, Mitch, because that was very interesting and certainly resonated with a lot of the experience that we've had in Australia, not just with the coal seam gas development, uh, which is obviously the closest parallel to the shale gas situation, but certainly with, with coal mining and mining in general in many communities. One of the things that I particularly noticed about what you said was the function that uncertainty is playing in all of this and that um, that's where we hope the value of information might prove itself. And one of the striking things about researching pe people who are dealing with the, ha having to make the decisions about whether and under what conditions various kinds of re resource extraction go ahead is that almost everybody, whatever side of the debate they're on, says, we need more information, but in point of fact, I suspect that they really, I mean, we've got oceans of information. It's being able to interpret that, and, and the fact that those interpretations are col colored by different values and different pre 
preconceptions and assumptions um, that is still making it very hard to come to decisions and, and certainly, as the cliche goes, you can't please all of the people all of the time and we, we're certainly finding that sort of um, situation. So uh, the other thing that this, what you've been talking about resonated with and, you, and you, you have obviously been placing it a lot in the risk analysis um, basket. That I've, I've been very interested in some of the work done by the risk governance people. And so the Maryland proposal is very interesting there because the idea of how you govern and how you make decisions and implement and manage situations where you've got uncertainty, where you've got big um, contests of perceptions and, and attitudes and what are frequently called wicked problems these days, um, th these sorts of things where values are playing as much of a part as information is playing, um, then, then these situations, I think, the, the challenges for the regulators to come up with management systems or governance systems would be very big. And the Maryland one does sound very interesting. We do have some differences in Australia, um, but basically a project is decided as a single project. And we have had a scheme in Queensland in the past where people were expected, or proponents were expected, to come up with what would be the cumulative impact of their proposal and this was basically put in the too hard basket. How can I know what my impacts plus somebody else's plus the projects that haven't even come on the drawing board yet might be going to be five years from now? So I'll be interested to see if Maryland manages to get it up into place and how it works um, with some of those provisions. But thank you. I think I'll just let Mitch um, answer that question, uh, answer one of those points. Particularly, I, I wondered in the Maryland cases, we, we talk a lot about social license to operate here. Have they actually got license to govern there if, if, if some of it's being vetoed at the beginning? Yeah, uh, I mean, it was a, uh, a proponents of, uh, of shale ga uh, gas drilling, particularly ones who thought that they were going to get leases on their property and make a lot of money, were opposed to this overall plan. Uh, but I, I think in the end what they did is they actually had a lot of input from the oil and gas industry on the specific requirements of uh, you know, well casings uh, and uh, double safety checks and monitoring and things of that sort. So they actually did, built that in a pretty collaborative way. Uh, and it was supported by the governor but uh, eventually it was just too, too much of a hot button issue that uh, uh, and so, uh, the state legislature uh, ended up uh, overriding the uh, governor's uh, plan and, and continuing a, now it's not, a, there's not a ban on fracking and this plan has not been scrapped. It is a temporary, it is a Moratorium, like we've got in New South Wales. Mor moratorium, there's a moratorium, right. It's like a moratorium, I don't know if you remember that EPA report on water I showed you. Mm -hmm. That's a draft report. Most EPA reports are draft reports, and they stay that way forever. They, because they, this way they don't have to, uh, this way if they, someone takes them to court over it, they could say, well, it's just a draft report. So, so you, this should really be value of draft information. <laughs> right, yeah, value of draft information, yeah. So anyways, the, uh, I, I think, yeah, it, it, it is an unusual situation. New York has a, uh, has a ban, I believe. Uh, you know, I guess any ban is just a moratorium since they could be overturned, uh, and, you know, vice versa. So. Uh, the uh, Illinois has a very good state program. They did a good job of, uh, I don't know how big of an area they have for drilling and whether anything started there. Colorado was very uh, pro-drilling, uh, and so they have a very, uh, you could see well pads right next to people's houses. Uh, same thing, and same thing in Texas. Texas, a lot of it is cultural. Texas has a long history of, of oil and gas activity at the family level. So everybody has a cousin or a uncle that's uh, in the oil and gas industry there. So it's, 
Yeah, thanks, Mitchell. Liz, I'm, I'm going to actually open up uh, for questions and comments for the audience. Can you raise your hands? I can see one already. Uh, can you raise your hands? And I'll, I'll basically just point. I'll, I'd ask you to um, say who you are, if you wouldn't mind, and then also uh, be, be quite fairly concise in, in the question. And I, I'm afraid you're going to have to shout. So. No, there's some microphones up the back there that are going to be brought down, I think. Or you can shout to the microphone or the, mi <laughs> or the microphone's There's a down. microphone coming down, yes. You can hang on. And, uh, and if anybody else, while, while that question's being asked and answered, if you could raise your hand and I'll keep an eye out as we go through. Thank you. I'm Ian Patterson. I'm an electrical engineer. And really it's just to, I'd be, now that we've got experts from both countries here, I'd really like to hear a, both uh, the, the comparison of the, the Queensland and the US experience. Uh, where, where you think that we did better than the US because the US sort of pioneered it and made a few mistakes, where you think we made the same mistakes, um, and where you might think that they did better than we did, uh, both in terms of public perception and benefit and, and in terms of regulation and uh, presentation. After that's you. Nice you, you can keep talking <laughs> for the rest of the evening about that. That's, that, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I'm going to hand that one to Will. You will notice that every, every country you go to in every state has got world's best practice regulation, but, but none of them are the same. So, will, I'm going to leave you to answer that one. Can you ask an easier question? <laughs> um, it, yeah, I, I, th I like the way you divided it up into who's done better in which domains. Uh, in some ways, you can't tell who's done better until things have played out for a while. I know a few years ago I went on a tour of the uh, gas fields in Wyoming, Powder River Basin, where they had coal bed methane. Similar kind of population density to here. You know, cultural differences about who gets the income from the wells. But here, we, you know, the landholder you know, has a, a conduct and compensation agreement with a gas company. And so they get anywhere from $2,500 to $10,000 a, a well, sometimes more, sometimes maybe a little less per year for, you know, the life of the well, which might be 20 or 30 years. But it's similar to, I guess, the um, a royalty stream in the U.S., but not, you know, uh, calculated based on the volume, just based on the fact that part of their land is occupied. But the culture in the two countries is quite different about income and how you talk about it. So Australians don't like to talk about success. So we actually don't know a lot in the public domain about how well people are doing based on the development because there aren't a lot of high profile stories. Whereas in the US, if somebody drops $15,000 on your land to say, we'd just like to sniff around and see if there's any methane, you go out and buy a used Cadillac and everybody knows you're doing well. So, so part of this, are we doing better or are we doing worse depends upon the way people tell the story in each country. And I can see strengths and weaknesses in both countries, but I know enough about what's going on not to pretend to be an authority in any one of the demands. Do you, do you want to add to that? Well, uh, yes, I'm, and I know I'm not an authority on <laughs> what was done in the UN, but, but um, one, of the thing, one of the comments that was up here before, um, I can't had in my head and now I've forgotten, but, but while, I, while I hope that that comes back, I'll say that a couple of areas that I think we did very badly in Australia, we seem to do badly, and I don't know whether they did these any better in, in the United States. Oh, that's what it was. Yes, yeah, so up here there was a comment about it's all right, perhaps, if you've got certain conditions in place to make it up as you go along. Well, we sure made it up as we went along in Queensland as far as the regulation side of things was concerned and as far as, and, and, and to the extent that we had any experience to build on, we were drawing on the experience largely with coal mining, which has some big differences. Uh, and I don't think we thought of that. But, so the government didn't do very well. They made it up as they went along. And I think the companies didn't do it very well in Australia, in at least one respect, as far as the social, well, probably many, but anyway, as far as the social and economic impacts were concerned, you mentioned Texas had had a lot of experience of this sort of thing. Most of the companies that were developing the big coal seam gas projects here in Queensland hadn't had 
a long history of onshore gas development in, in Australia. And I think that they showed they were novices to the field. They didn't understand how you get benefits distributed. They thought benefits distribution was easy for them because here the state government gets the royalties and it's up to them to distribute it, isn't it? And it's up to them to, to address the impacts and things like that. So those were some of the mistakes I think I'd, I'd point out in Queensland perhaps. How much of the, uh, of the rules are made at the national level versus the uh, no, provincial it's level? The same. It's, it's the same as we oh, well, have. Well, yeah, for, in terms of these impacts and stuff like that, it's, it's the state level. Are they very different from one province to the next? Well, I mentioned before, at the moment, New South Wales has got a moratorium. Right. <laughs> uh, so just like us. Yes, the answer, <laughs> the answer is yes. So, so the answer to better or worse is the U.S. is such a wide canvas of, of, of different practices. You, you really have to pick a state to compare with, and then you have to define what's worse. Uh, it made me think when you were saying which better and worse, whether you're on the blue side or the red side of the first slide, it might come up with quite a different answer. Do we have any more questions coming up from the audience? This gentleman here. Oh. Yeah, just yell. Yeah, I, I, th I, th I think, I, I mean, there's, let me step back and say, what is it about a scientific study that makes it trustworthy? Uh, one thing is you do, do want to know who's funding it. You want to know who's doing it and that they have, that they're competent. Uh, you want to have independent third party review, you know, in the engineering, sci and well, in all of our scholarly activities, we have uh, uh, peer review of our, of our journal submissions. And that's, uh, we consider that a, uh, important part of the uh, quality assurance. Bring some other things along with it, but it's, it's part of it. Uh, and when we write proposals, they get peer reviewed. Uh, and so it's nice. I, I've been on some independent third party panels uh, that have done some environmental work and I, they usually work out okay. Uh, it's, you know, both sides hate you that you've done pretty good. The, uh, the, uh, uh, I can, I can comment on yeah, that. I, I actually did my PhD on that topic, you know, 20 some years ago. And since nobody's read it, I'll tell you, and then two of us will know what I found. Uh, the notion is if you, if you look at, uh, you know, some very fundamental things about psychology and philosophy and how people come to understand other people, there are actually six different categories we assess when we're determining whether or not we want to heed what somebody's saying. And that is, you know, who's talking? You know, and have they been a friend of me in the past and do I expect them to be a friend in the future? Um, what is the process involved in this exchange I'm having with them? Is it a talk in a pub or testimony in court? Has this process worked for me in the past and do I expect it to work for me in the future? And then the information, does it resonate with things I already know and do I expect it to give outcomes that I would like? And so you have this complex, what I call the negotiation of expert status, deciding whom to listen to when you don't completely fathom what they're saying. And the challenge with those six categories is often the engineer is focusing on one box and the citizen activist is focusing on another box. So they're often not even on the same page. So it's not even a question of belief or disbelief. It's a question of a total lack of engagement. It's a quixotic situation. Same planet, two different worlds. Yeah, I think uh, the term that sometimes is, is used is that the people that want to defend a study that usually shows that an activity is safe when other people think it's not, uh, you know, usually say, well, we did the science right, you know, but then the opponents say, but you did the wrong science. You didn't look at the endpoints that we're concerned about. Uh, in terms of Maryland and other states, uh, I don't know. <laughs> the, uh, it's, uh, I, I think a lot of political factors come in there. The, the media plays an important role uh, in, in terms of you know what gets uh, 
uh, emphasized and, 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 and amplified. Mitch, can I, so, can I add something? Uh, one of the other things that I think has come out of your research, and, and I certainly feel like I've seen it too, is that people are more, most likely to trust, it wasn't one of your PhD findings, Will, people are most likely to trust a study if they've had some input or feel they've had some control, some say about what was looked at in the study. So like you said, they tend to say you didn't look at the right things, perhaps, if they want to dismiss it. But yes, giving p so, so not just people having participation in monitoring and, and later stages, that we've heard a lot of talk about there being public participation in, but actually participation in working out what do we need to investigate here and how would be a good way to go about that. Yeah, uh, if you could maybe just pick on, Will, how you involve the community in your piece of work that's just come out and, and actually explain what the metrics are and how you can access them. Uh, okay, so, uh, so what we did, so knowing that there's this, um, this issue about making information believable, we went and we found publicly available databases on, you know, population, you know, business income, uh, the rents on three-bedroom houses, because the rents really skyrocketed in some of these smaller towns, rising by, let's say, 180% in the town of Miles during the peak of CSG construction. And that would lead, you know, lower-income people to move out to escape the higher rents. <coughs> so we got the, we had a long list of indicators because we know that there are many things that people measure, and the problem is when they report on them, they end up with 300-page reports that very few people like to read, unless they're you know, paid to and assigned to. So we said, if you could condense that to six PowerPoint slides, what would be on the slides? So we went to industry, government, and community and said, let's prioritize, and came up with the indicators we were focusing on. We then took the charts for an individual town, the people in that town, key stakeholders, not everybody, but you know, the mayor, the top real estate agent, school principal, police sergeant, and we showed them a chart of a trend in, let's say, crime rates to the police sergeant and said, what's happening? And they would explain to us what was happening. And through that process, we assembled a story, data and explanations, or they explained mechanisms, how things happened. We assembled that into a data booklet and sent it back to the community and said, here we've told your story, and they shrugged up their shoulders and said, yeah, it looks like it, but why are you telling us? We lived through it. But it's gotten a lot of interest in state government because they had a sense they knew what was going on. And now they had the data at the town level and the narrative at the town level, which they hadn't had before. And so that's a way of involving people in the research process and in the hope of gaining some credibility. And now this approach has been picked up, elements of it have been picked up by the Coordinator General's Office to look at the impacts of FIFO on fly and fly out on communities. Gentleman in the middle. Uh, John Percival's my name. I'm a retired architect. Do, do you imagine that what Mitch has described here tonight, with regard to things like a comprehensive shale gas development plan, would occur with wind farms and solar farms? The ongoing issues over uh, pollution, uh, environmental damage, and all the rest of it that people worry about, can you see that happening? In, you know, this, yeah, this, this review of, 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 you know, needing scientific knowledge and so on and so forth, and it leads people to uh, uh, disregard this or, or dispute that well, with regard to... I think to, there's to, evidence you know, that it has happened with, certainly with wind farms. There's been a lot of contention around wind farms on pretty much the same sorts of grounds as, as there are objections to other sorts of energy production. So... Um, yeah, I think that it, it can happen, and, and Mitch's research is related to many areas besides shale gas yeah. that are contentious policy areas and yeah. where these same sorts of things. I, I think you'd have a, a better chance of success with wind farms and solar because you take away the, I mean, you have the benefit that, indisputable, that you're, that you're helping uh, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, to, no, people do dispute it, Mitch. Sorry, but they... <laughs>